Okay. So Dr. John Doyle is a retired staff anesthesiologist in the Department of General Anesthesiology at Cleveland Clinic, as well as a retired professor of anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. He first joined Mensa in 1972. And tonight he will be talking about um, medical AI, examples, opportunities, and cautionary tales, which offers an exploration of the current state of artificial intelligence in the field of medicine aimed at the intelligent public. By highlighting real world examples, discussing potential opportunities, and examining cautionary tales, the talk aims to provide a balanced perspective on the roles of AI in healthcare. The presentation will introduce the audience to types of AI and its applications in medicine and showcase notable examples where AI has already demonstrated its value, such as in med medical imaging interpretation, early disease detection, precision medicine, and robotic surgery. Through these examples, attendees will witness the potential transformative power of AI in improving patient outcomes, and enhancing diagnose, uh, diagnostic and optimizing treatment plans. The session will also delve into cautionary tales associated with medical AI. It will address the limitations, challenges, and potential risks that need to be considered when implementing AI solutions in healthcare. The talk will also discuss ethical considerations, including data privacy, security, and the responsible use of AI algorithms. And it will also explore the importance of human AI collaboration and emphasize the need for healthcare professionals to be knowledgeable about AI technologies and their implications. So I now would like to present to you, Dr. Doyle. Good to see you again. We're happy you're here. Thank you for the kind introduction. Let me do the share. And hopefully everyone can see the uh, initial slide, Medical AI for the Intelligent Layman. I have no conflicts of interest, and uh, there is a disclosure that I used uh, AI services in the preparation of this presentation. If you want a copy of the slides, you can get, uh, get me on email at djdoyle at hotmail.com, and I'd be glad to send a copy. I'm an anesthesiologist. Uh, here's a recent photograph of me assisting an anesthesia resident in inserting a breathing tube or endotracheal tube. Uh, here are my uh, clinical credentials. Graduated from uh, the University of Toronto in 82 in medicine and past president of the Society of Airway Management, the Society for Technology and Anesthesia. But I uh, also have uh, other qualifications I'll bring to your attention. What do anesthesiologists do? They manipulate consciousness for a living, usually using drugs, especially propofol and sevoforane. Also good at blocking pain, like uh, spinal anesthesia using lidocaine. Also caring for ICU patients and perioperative care, care of the patient uh, in the surgical period. My undergraduate degree was in physics. I did four years of medical school, four years of residency, and then fellowship training. That's the usual arrangement for people who become an anesthesiologist. Uh, I'm also an author. Um, we'll take a look at some of the material I've written. Um, some of it's philosophical, some of it's clinical, and some of it is technical. My engineering qualifications involve a PN certification and a PhD in electrical engineering, various certifications in computer programming, um, and I still play with computers a lot. In fact, in 1988, I wrote this book, Computer Programs in Clinical Laboratory Medicine, that were in the basic programming language, which pretty much nobody uses anymore. Uh, earlier than that, I wrote a series of programs for critical care applications that was published by Mosby Systems. This was in 1985, almost 40 years ago. And you can imagine things have moved along in 40 years. This was the computer that we used. It was a little handheld computer with a one-line LCD display and a matching printer, programmable in BASIC, and you could write your own programs. And of course, uh, these programs were on cassette tape in the days because in those days, uh, floppy disks were uh, hard to get. Um, they came later with the development of the PC. But they're still useful. Here's an example of some research I did taking a look at respiratory mechanics, the alveolar arterial oxygen tension difference for various levels of oxygen and various kinds of shunt, just to give you an example of how we can solve interesting equations. Uh, and you can see that in this early work, 
uh, that we published with Mosby, there's a whole pile of things that uh, it would do that would be useful in clinical care. This we'll see is basically rule-based artificial intelligence as opposed to the more modern firms of artificial intelligence that I'll be bringing to your attention in a while. So let's explore the realm of artificial intelligence in medicine. Some questions we'd like to address are the types of AI, how AI maps work, rule-based AI, and how that compares with deep learning and machine learning, what chat, chat GPT is doing, what explainable AI is doing, some discussion on early warning systems, the Turing test from the imitation game, and sentience as a possible emergent property of AI, but the philosophical difficulties that it raises. On the right, you can see there's a variety of medical applications, arterial blood gas, ABG interpretation is something that I will comment on. And I'll later be commenting briefly on the ethical considerations like data privacy, security, and the responsible use of AI. So as way of introduction, AI has rapidly changed the way we live and work in the 21st century, showing up in various fields, including medicine and the integration of AI into medicine has enormous potential to improve patient outcomes and increase the efficacy of the healthcare system. But what is AI? Because as you can see from the illustration here, there's many very uh, uh, different forms of AI, machine learning, neural networks. It's involved in robotics, uh, natural language processing, uh, fuzzy logic, expert systems. And on the bottom left, the expert systems approach is what I worked on early on uh, some 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and we'll have a chance to take a look at that but we'll also take a look at some of the more modern systems that are based on neural networks, which in many cases are far more powerful. Here's another illustration of where artificial intelligence goes as cognitive science applications, uh, robotics applications, and natural interface applications like speech and language. And so uh, there are many different variations of it. As you can see here are uh, some applications of artificial intelligence. They vary from thought-controlled gaming to real-time universal translations to chatbots like ChatGPT, deep learning and neural networks, and we'll see that in radiology. Um, so there's a lot of different applications, as you can see here, but sometimes it's useful to divide them into various classes. Uh, and the simplest form is reactive machines uh, specialized for peculiar tasks, perhaps for making coffee in a uh, um, simple coffee maker something uh, that may be more uh, advanced but limited in memory, monitoring of traffic lights, then something more advanced that focuses on emotions, ideas, thoughts, and objects. ChatGPT is an example of that. And then self-aware artificial intelligence has the ability to react full of emotions and advanced capabilities of decision-making. One question is whether, whether we could actually get to self-aware as an emergent property of artificial intelligence systems. Some philosophers think that it's just... Uh, not something that we can test for, and more about that in a little while. In healthcare, there's a variety of uh, potential roles for uh, AI in healthcare, expanded access to medical systems, improved decision-making, um, <clears throat> checking health through uh, wearable devices, and we're gonna take a look at what Apple has done there, even the possibility of assisting with end-of-life care. You can see that this has generated a whole variety of different new startups in various fields. Um, here are 106 startups transforming healthcare with AI. So it's a very active field. And we'll see which ones become standard and which ones pass by the wayside. So medical AI applications include medical imaging, which we'll take a look at. Diagnosis, we'll take a look at that. Treatment and uh, clinical de decision support systems. Uh, the idea is to monitor and predict disease progression, help analyze electronic health records, provide decision support. And we'll give some specific examples in a while. Here's an example, number one, where the computer says, I know that you took out vancomycin for the patient, vancomycin being a expensive, uh, but very effective antibiotic. It says, be sure to give it slowly over an hour to avoid excessive vasodilatation or red band syndrome. So the computer can say, hey, be careful, that drug, uh, you give it too fast, the guy will turn red, his blood pressure will drop, and you'll be stuck with dealing with it. Uh, example number two on the right, the increased variability in the photoplethysmograph tracing suggests that the patient is hypovolemic. So these are rules. Rule number one, uh, you're going to use vancomycin, 
give it slowly. Rule number two, increased pulse variability uh, suggests that the patient might be low in blood volume and require, for example, extra plasma or extra saline or whatever. So these are some examples. Uh, sometimes you can actually explain what's going on. Uh, for example, here it says the patient has a corrected QT interval of 420 milliseconds, which is normal, uh, and it explains how it got this measurement and the rule for it, or this is for the electrocardiogram. Another example, at 6.1 milligrams per ml, uh, the patient has severe uh, hyperkalemia, high potassium levels, look for peaked T waves on the electrocardiogram, and then it says follow protocol one, two, five, four, three, which you would then look up and it would tell you exactly how to manage severe hyperkalemia. So this is an example of, it might tell you what to do next. So there's a variety of AI algorithms. Some of them we'll take a look at. Some of them are uh, very complicated that uh, is beyond the scope of this presentation since I just wanna give you an overview. But decision tree algorithms are something that we can understand and we'll take a look at some of these decision trees. Here is a schematic showing the types of artificial intelligence, showing that it can be divided into classical as well as machine learning and a form of machine learning that uses deep neural networks with multiple layers is called deep learning. We'll have a chance to take a look at that momentarily. So machine and deep learning or network algorithms provide a diagnosis, but they do not explain the reasoning behind the diagnosis. You have input data, you have a number of layers to what these are called artificial neurons, uh, basically uh, driven by the idea that there's neurons in the brain they have an output layer that has an output. Uh, so let's take a look at some practical applications of AI to provide a foundation. Self-driving cars, that's an example that we're getting comfortable with more and more, autonomous driving. There are a number of challenges that remain, particularly under difficult circumstances like night, snowstorms, that kind of thing. Surgical robots, um, they can be useful, uh, but, what you should know about surgical robots at the moment is that uh, they are basically glorified micro manipulators and they simply do whatever the operator wants. Uh, but uh, AI can be built in in a rule-based system. One thing that uh, the general population doesn't know is that surgical robots are controversial in that they can take a two-hour case and make it into a four-hour case. Uh, and that consumes OR resources plus the surgical robots cost in the range of a million plus. Uh, and there are certain surgeons who insist on using the robots uh, when they're not really required because if they don't use them enough, they'll become de-skilled. So we're gonna see how that plays out and where surgical robots can be useful and where they are overplayed. One thing we do see a lot of is the use of the Apple Watch and here the, uh, Apple Watch has come up with a diagnosis of sinus rhythm. That's normal uh, sinus rhythm, your normal rhythm that you see all the time every day in normal people. Uh, but it also detects other rhythm disturbances like uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, in fact, it depends on which particular watch model you get. And if you get the most advanced version, it will notify you of high heart rates, low heart rates, irregular rhythms. Uh, some of them are working on blood oxygen levels with an optical sensor, detect uh, hypoxemia, for example, and then fall detection based on accelerometers and gyroscopes built in. So more and more uh, Apple Watch technology is aimed at medicine. So here's a heart rate modification. Your heart rate uh, rose above 120 while you were seeming inactive for 10 minutes, um, and it tells you when. What's interesting is that the day after my son got his uh, immunization for COVID, uh, this alarm went off. He had uh, cardiac irritation from the immunization uh, and myocarditis that was mild, didn't require any treatment or anything, and didn't persist, but the, uh, the, the watch detected it. Uh, here, the watch can detect possible atrial fibrillation, uh, and we know that that's potentially an important thing because it increases the uh, risk of a stroke times five, and there's a variety of treatments available. So here is the electrocardiogram app. Notice that the Apple Watch never checks for heart attacks, uh, but it is possible that in the future, it looks at what's called the ST segment of the electrocardiogram and warns you of an heart attack 
uh, because of an analysis of the ST segment. I'm sure that's something that's going to become along in the future. And uh, that can be something that can save lives. Fall detection, uh, it's here, it has an accelerometer and it says it looks like you've taken a hard fall. You can either click that I'm okay, or you can call an emergency SOS. What's interesting is that there have been cases of people who have gone uh, on rides uh, in, the, in uh, county fairs uh, and got bumped. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, it automatically called an SOS. Uh, so that can be an issue that needs to be dealt with. Now, many patients have something like this on their watch, uh, who to contact in the case of an emergency, but it turns out that there's a medical ID feature in the Apple Watch, which gives things like age, blood type, and emergency contacts. So all of that can be very useful. Uh, also medications, it can tell you when to take medication. Uh, and if you skipped it, uh, you can let it know. So a medication reminder can be very useful. Uh, here is uh, an accessory you can get called Cardia that records your uh, electrocardiogram with a separate device. And here is a device, the Dexcom, that will communicate with your Apple Watch to look at your blood glucose levels and trend it over time. So that is something that is making uh, management of uh, type one, in particular type one diabetes, more manageable. Uh, you can alter your uh, infusion rate based on this particular reading that you get. So let's go back in time to what arguably is the founder of artificial intelligence, depending on how you look at it, Alan Turing, who um, wrote this article, Computing Machinery and Intelligence in the Journal Mind, a philosophical journal, concerned with the philosophy of mind. Uh, and the idea is that uh, he offers a new form of problem described in terms of a game, which we can call the imitation game. So person A uh, is in contact with either machine or person B, and based on this electronic communication and it's simply text communication, has to establish whether or not this person is uh, real or whether it's a machine. So that was the challenge he put up and he called it the imitation game. So he proposes to consider the question, can machines think? And he begins with definition of what it means to be a machine and what it means to be think, uh, to, to think. Uh, and he offers a big discussion on this that remains important to this day. He invented the concept of a Turing machine, which is a mathemat mathematical abstraction or model of computation describing an abstract machine that manipulates symbols on a strip of tape according to a set of rules. Despite the model's simplicity, it's capable of implementing any computer algorithm. So those of you who want to learn more about the imitation game and Turing, I recommend this movie, uh, The Imitation Game. There's a review on the right, what a brilliant movie and et cetera, et cetera. And no doubt you will enjoy it, particularly this crowd. So the Turing test has now been passed easily by new forms of artificial intelligence, particularly ChatGPT. Uh, if, if you are just contacting ChatGPT and you didn't know that it was an AI, you would think, well, it's indistinguishable from a person. And it says here, the Turing test has long been a benchmark for machine intelligence, but what it really measures is deception. And those of you who are interested in this can read the philosophical story behind this. Even earlier than ChatGPT uh, from last November, in 1965, there was a computer scientist who developed a concept a program called ELIZA, an interactive computer program that could converse in English with a person. The, the presentation was superficial, but many people attributed anthropomorphic uh, characteristics to ELIZA. And uh, please tell me what's been bothering you. The weather is awful. I'm not sure I understand you fully. I hate the current weather. You say you hate the current weather, question mark. Yes, that's what I said. ELIZA says, I understand. And, doesn't take them long to figure out that there's not much depth to this. Um, but there is depth to chat GPT, and we'll have an example of that. And another example, Watson, a natural language question answering machine created by IBM, defeated two former Jeopardy champions. Uh, and this is an example of the kind of knowledge that can be built into computers, particularly um, this one. 
by Watson, natural language question answering computer. Now in November, ChatGPT has come and it's the new technological trend of the day. It uh, started a new age of AI and I'm going to talk about that in a little while. Now, I should remind you that all artificial intelligence depends on some form of knowledge representation. So some forms of knowledge representation are rules. I'll give some examples of that. For example, if the BMI is exceeding 30, by definition, you are obese. Uh, that definition may be wrong, um, and there may be refinements, but according to uh, conventional medical rules now, that's an example. Uh, med uh, medical maps and other forms of maps, I'll show you some examples, and flowcharts, I'll show you some examples. Other things that uh, we're not going to talk about in detail include semantic networks, just to introduce you to it, and neural networks, part of deep learning. So many forms of knowledge representation. One of the first ones that I had a chance to play with uh, 30, 40 years ago was uh, develop knowledge base from an expert, the expert being a doctor working in conjunction with a textbook, and you develop an inference engine and then a user interface. So some examples, uh, if the patient is diabetic, if the hemoglobin A1C is 6.5 or above, uh, that's a definition from the American Diabetes Society. First degree electrocardiogram block is presented it's present if the PR interval of the electrocardiogram exceeds 200 milliseconds. So you take a look at the electrocardiogram, you measure out the PR interval. If it's more than 200, you have a first degree heart block and that's a diagnosis. Patient is obese if their BMI is 30 or over. Another way of knowledge representation is semantic networks that we're not going to spend a lot of time on, except that uh, a mammal is an uh, animal, for example. A bear is an example of an animal, uh, a mammal. A whale is an example of a uh, uh, a mammal, but a whale lives in water where a bear has fur and so on. So this is how you might want to represent knowledge. So I asked ChatGPT, uh, well, tell me about semantic networks. And here's an example of what it said. A semantic network is a form of knowledge representation that organizes information in graph-like structures with concepts representative nodes and the relationship between those concepts represented as links. And for example, in a semantic network about animals, the node dog might be connected to the node pet by an edge labeled is a, indicating the dog is a type of pet. Um, and then it goes on with more detail. Now, this is a pretty good answer. And what you'll find is that ChatGPT provides some really excellent answers. But as we'll see later, there are some cautionary tales. Okay, one of the things you'd like with AI is that it's explained its reasoning. Uh, you want to provide human understandable explanations. It aims to address the lack of transparency by incorporating interpretability into AI systems. This can be crucial in healthcare finance justice where AI decisions have significant world, uh, real world impacts. One way of doing this is through rule-based systems. Uh, and I'll give some examples of that, but there are other methods as well as shown here. And this is something that is a field of active research now uh, to explain to the user what's going on. Okay. Well, let's take a look at some examples of rule-based AI because uh, it's fairly easy to understand what's going on. Clinical early warning systems are systems which will tell you early on that you can expect trouble with this patient in a little while. So in anesthesia, surgery, and ICU care, AI algorithms can be used to monitor patients, calculate drug doses, predict potential complications, and AI algorithms can help monitor patients and provide early warning. And early warning systems exist that are based on simple rule-based AI. A clinical early warning system is a computer-based system that helps to identify patients who are at risk of deteriorating and provides early warning of potential adverse events. They're commonly used in intensive care units to monitor patients and provide real-time assessments of their condition. For those of you who want to read more about it, here's a sample reference um, from the journal Resuscitation. It's nine years old now, and so you can imagine there's been some refinement since then, but it gives the basic outline of how they work. And typically, you'll measure pulse, temperature, systolic blood pressure. That's the bigger number of the two, like 120 over 80. Well, 120 would be systolic blood pressure, the respiratory rate, breaths per minute, the level of consciousness, the saturation that you get with a pulse oximeter, and whether supplemental oxygen is used. So that's an example of the kind of inputs. And the kind of displays you get are screens like this, where it'll take a look at various indices of concern and plot them out and even change the color of the background 
um, to indicate that there are concerns present. So <clears throat> parameters such as heart rate, blood pressure, saturation are the things that are followed. The goal is to identify patients who are at risk of worsening before they become critically ill, so prompt interventions can be made. And you can even send a text message or an SS, SMS message to the doctor to ensure the problem doesn't get overlooked. And they could lead to improved patient outcomes, reduced morbidity, mortality, and hopefully reduced healthcare costs. So again, here are some of the things that we might wanna take a look at. So the original national health system that's from the UK, uh, early warning system had this scoring system and it's called NEWS the NHS early warning score. And here is what it take a, took, took a look at. For example, if the pulse is under 40, you get three points. If the pulse is over 131, you get three points. If the temperature is uh, less than 35 Celsius, that's three points. Uh, if the systolic pressure is less than 90, you get three points and so on. So basically at each point in time, the measurements, you get various measurements associated with this. And here is a modification of that uh, that has been published. And here you take a look at what the score is for it and you decide what to do based on that score. So for example, here, uh, if the score is one to two, you perform two hourly observations, inform the nurse in charge. If this patient has a score of three, one to two hourly observations inform the nurse in charge. If the patient is four or more, you must do half hourly observations, ensure medical advice is sought and contact the outreach team who will come and visit the patient. So this is a modification of the early warning system. Here's one that's uh, aimed at pediatrics uh, for ages three months to one year. If the pediatric early warning score is four or more, uh, increase the frequency to one per four hours. If it's more than six or more, uh, increase it to frequency of hourly, more than eight, contact the attending physician within 10 minutes or call for the rescue system. So this is the pediatric early warning score. So uh, these are actually useful and used, particularly in uh, uh, the United Kingdom where it was invented. Uh, just to move on to other examples, there's many textbooks and review articles and other sources of information on this. Uh, here are some examples of conferences that are held dealing with artificial intelligence and uh, healthcare uh, knowledge representation. Let's take a look at some of the various approaches to medical AI in more detail. I've already given the example of uh, the diabetic patient or the patient with the first degree heart block. Uh, and these are simple rule-based examples. Sometimes they're more complicated. Here's one where you're trying to figure out what kind of organism. So if the gram stain is gram positive and the morphology is caucus and the conformation is chains, then the organism is possibly streptococcus. Note that it's a probability thing here. Uh, it's not saying it is for certain, but if it is possibly streptococcus, you wanna think in that direction. So if then else statements are often used in rule-based approaches to AI as seen on the right, and many of you are already familiar with if then else statements in their uh, computer coding. And here's an example of uh, code written in C. Um, this applies with an Arduino, just showing that if something is present, then do this, otherwise do something else. So in the rule-based approaches to medical AI, to go back to the modified early warning system, you can see there are some rules. If the early warning system is two or less, observe the patient every two hours. If it's three, observe every one to two hours. And it's four or more, observe the patient every 30 minutes. Another example is the Forrester heart failure classification, where it takes a look at two performance indices for the heart. One of them is cardiac index, the liters per minute per meter squared body surface area. That's the vertical axis. And the other one is the capillary wedge pressure, which obtained with a special instrument called a pulmonary cap, uh, which uh, Swan-Gans catheter or pulmonary artery catheter. Uh, and depending on what your cardiac index is and what your permanent capillary wedge pressure is, you can divide uh, the patient into four subsets and each subset is associated with a different approach. For example, if you subset one normal, well, you don't have to do anything. In subset three, uh, the patient is uh, per, uh, hypoperfusing and they need more fluid, for example. Uh, 
Now, this uh, was actually part of uh, the package we presented for Critical Care Consultant, again, uh, almost 40 years ago. Another example of what's done is we take blood from an artery. You can see this uh, patient uh, in the ICU with a breathing tube in place, an endotracheal tube. They are taking a blood gas example from the radial artery. And you need two parameters to get a diagnosis, the hydrogen ion concentration in nano equivalents per mil or the carbon dioxide tension in millimeters of mercury. And those two provide an acid-based diagnosis. So here is a map which um, provides a diagnosis, which could be, for example, normal, acute respiratory acidosis, acute respiratory alkalosis, metabolic alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, and so on, depending on these two parameters that you enter. Uh, well, we wrote software for this using the MAP approach. Uh, here is an example in flowchart form. And you can see on the right, there are a variety of diagnoses like combined acidosis, uncompensated metabolic acidosis, uncompensated metabolic acidosis, and so on. And you can see it's all based on flowcharts. You start with the pH or hydrogen ion concentration. If the pH is less than 7.35 and the carbon dioxide concentration is more than 7.45 and the bicarb is less than 22, then it goes off. And I'll show you that in a little while. So it shows you how the algorithm is carried out. And it may result in a partially compensated respiratory acidosis or combined acidosis, depending again on where you go in the flowchart. So here's an example uh, in more detail. If the pH is less than 7.35, PCO2 is over 45, bicarb is under uh, 22, then it's combined acidosis. If the bicarb is more than 26 in this, then it's a uh, partially compensated respiratory acidosis. And you basically print this out on the computer, and then it can even give you hints about what could be going on. Uh, but most of it, you'd understand that from your textbook training. So let's take a look at AI in, in, in more detail now. Uh, we've looked at rule-based AI and maps and flowcharts. Here's artificial intelligence again. And sometimes when we take a look at learning and deep learning, we talk about supervised versus unsupervised learning. Let's take a look at that in more detail. There's supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And I'd like to show you the difference between the two. So two basic approaches, supervised and unsupervised learning. The difference is that supervised learning uses labeled data to predict outcomes, while unsupervised learning does not. And I'll give you some examples. So here is some input data. Uh, these might be images of apples. And in each image, we say these are apples. And we develop a model. And so when we get this particular apple, uh, it says, oh, this looks like the apple from the training data. So step one, provide the machine algorithm uh, with labeled data. So we provide examples of cats and we say they're all cats. They go into the machine and then feed the machine new unlabeled information to see if it tags new data appropriately. If not, continue refining the program with more test cases. Uh, and these types of problems for which it suited classification sorting items into categories, as well as regression, identifying real values. But classification for diagnosis, it might be, for example, as we'll see in, uh, in examples, picking up lung nodules that can be cancer. Unsupervised learning is different. You get input data and it sorts it out without being told what they are based on morphological and other characteristics that they have in common. So that's unsupervised learning. Here, you provide the machine learning algorithm with un uh, categorized unlabeled data, see what pattern emerges. It develops similarities. So one group is similar to cats. Another similarity group would be dogs. And this is useful for various kinds of problems, such as clustering and anomaly detection. There are many other kinds of AI algorithms. Some of them we don't have time to go into. For example, Bayesian algorithms based on probabilities uh, is another form of medical diagnosis, but we're not going to cover it in detail. Rather, what I want to emphasize is the neural network approach, uh, which is the most common approach used for radiological and some other kinds of examples. There's an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And there's many hidden layers which are updated with connection weights each time new data is offered to it for training. So an example might be in anesthesia, 
after multiple trainings, we look at the power of the electroencephalogram, the entropy of the electroencephalogram, the mean arterial pressure, and heart rate variability. And this data goes in to establish whether the patient is awake or asleep, just as an example. Now let's take a look at ChatGPT as an example, because since November, it has really changed the face of uh, artificial intelligence. It is a large language model, and there's lots to know about it. I asked ChatGPT itself, what are some AI applications in anesthesia? And it came up with some pretty good answers. Predictive modeling, real-time monitoring, uh, sedation depth monitoring, prediction of post-operative pain, assistance with difficult airway management, et cetera, et cetera. So not bad. Uh, but as we'll see, sometimes the answers you get are a little off kilter. Well. Um, I gave it some questions that you might ask a medical student or a resident. Please explain the precautions that anesthesiologists must take to reduce the risk of gas, uh, gastric aspiration, aspiration following the induction of general anesthesia in the patient with incomplete gastric emptying. So the problem here is that if you have stuff in the stomach when you put the patient to sleep, uh, for example, they might have gotten a car accident immediately after going to McDonald's, uh, we have to make sure that the stuff that uh, is in the stomach doesn't get into the lungs, and that's called aspiration, causing a deadly complication called aspiration pneumonitis. So here it comes up with uh, a number of uh, comments. Some of them are helpful and some of them are not. So this patient should be placed in the left lateral decubitus position, and as a rule, we do not actually do that. Uh, what we do do is a technique called rapid sequence induction with cricoid pressure, uh, and it doesn't mention that, and no mention of putting the breathing tube in awake, which is another option in this setting. So unfortunately, while it gives lots of details, the most important thing, the rapid sequence induction technique, it forgot about, it didn't know about. So kind of it, it failed, although it gave me lots of useful stuff. Okay, here's discuss potential implications and contraindications in performing an awake fiber optic intubation in the patient with suspected difficult airway. So in some patients, it's not easy to put in the breathing tube uh, and we have to do it awake using a fiberscope. Uh, and this is something that we do under topical anesthesia. So it gave a whole pile of uh, commentary here and a lot of it's pretty good. Uh, it doesn't give some specific details that may be useful, but overall it would be a better than uh, expected answer from a medical student. Okay, what about uh, parturient, this is a person who's about to deliver in need of emergency cesarean section for profound fetal bradycardia. So if you have low heart rate in the fetus, uh, you got to get that baby out um, right away uh, for an emergency cesarean section. So this is a, a dreaded situation, which happens in obstetrics and obstetric anesthesia relatively frequently. Uh, it has some comments that are maybe or may not be useful. It recommends regional anesthesia here as a choice. Um, and that's really not a good answer to that. But in, here it does mention the rapid sequence induction. So it didn't know about it before, but it did mention it in this particular case. And it has other things that are important. Preparation for resuscitation, multidisciplinary team approach, fetal monitoring, all of which are reasonable. So I asked ChatGPT, well, make a multiple choice examination on the topic of general anesthesia. Uh, and here's what it came up with. What are common methods for uh, administering general anesthesia? Uh, inhalation, uh, intravenous, uh, topical application, all of the above, and the answer A and B, yep, yeah, that's correct. What are the potential risks? All of these are technically correct. So this can be very useful if you want to generate the first draft of a multiple choice exam, uh, and then you'll have to tune it up. Uh, Here's some multiple choice exam questions on the topic of tracheal intubation. That's the art and science of putting in the breathing tube, uh, uh, typically for general anesthesia for the ICU. And not bad, it's useful stuff. And here's some potential complications that it talks about. And it generated all of this without any assistance from me. Uh, so then I went on to see, well, how could ChatGPT be useful? So give me an outline for a lecture on artificial intelligence and medicine with emphasis on its application to anesthesia surgery and ICU care. And based on that, I was able to come up with some ideas for this lecture and other ones. So here's an outline, introduction, AI in anesthesia, AI in surgery, AI in ICU care, AI in clinical decision supports and challenges and limitations, all of which are reasonable things. 
Uh, here's um, more stuff when I asked about uh, artificial intelligence in medicine, definitions, its role in medical imaging, predictive analytics, clinical decision support systems, drug discovery, which I'll be com com commenting on in a little while, as well as things like the future of AI. So uh, these are not necessarily what you want, but it's a pretty good starting point a lot of the time. So then I went and asked more, uh, more adventurous stuff. I said, write me a poem about suffering because uh, in the surgical world, suffering is commonplace. What kind of insights can we get? So it wrote this poem uh, and it's not bad. Suffering, a weight so heavy and grand, a burden that can bend the strongest man, a pain so deep it cuts like a knife, leaves us to struggle and fight for our life. But through suffering, we find our strength, a resilience and courage that travels great lengths. We learn to endure and hold on tight. And in the end, we emerge a new light. So this poem is suggesting that there are benefits associated uh, with suffering. Uh, that is a philosophical question that's a matter of debate. I think that there's relatively little value in suffering, but artists and writers may disagree. Um, at one point, I was interested in writing a novel. Um, I did a number of medevac rescues uh, uh, many years ago uh, where we flew all over the world. Uh, and so I thought it would be interesting to write a novel where the protagonist rescues a Peace Corps worker via medic at flight. And um, it came up with this outline that is not bad, a good, good starting point. The protagonist, former military pilot living a quiet life in rural America, receives a call from an old friend. Patient's uh, friend's daughter, a uh, Peace Corps worker, has been in a terrible overseas accident, need to be evacuated for medical treatment. And then it goes on and on. So overall, it's got um, yeah, definitely some ideas that you could work with if you want to write a novel or a short story. Okay, so ChatGPT, um, it's amazing, but as we'll see, it has its uh, caveats, uh, and I'll end with that. But let's go back to AI and healthcare. Um, here's an article, Artificial Intelligence, the New Alexander Fleming, for which I was co-author of. Uh, and this was published in Healthcare Informatics Research. Uh, could be that AI is the next best thing in tackling drug-resistant pathogens by coming up with possible new molecules that could be useful in treating pathogens, particularly bacterial pathogens. Um, so here's a platform uh, that uses machine learning, it's called the Ampli platform. It connects the digital biological biome to high volume peptides and protein extraction technology to unlock uh, new frontiers in drug discovery. So the idea is that it uses artificial intelligence to try and come up with new molecules that could be useful. What about radiology? Here's where it's been particularly interesting. You input radiology images, it extracts various features, it classifies it, uh, in terms of the pathology present and uh, predicts the disease. Uh, they uh, often refer to uh, these uh, AI uses in radiology as an extra pair of eyes for radiologists. So the radi radiologist may take a look at the x-ray and then see what uh, AI says and see if it missed anything. So here is an example. Uh, this uh, particular software product detects 20 odd chest lesions from conventional chest x-rays, things like lung nodules, fractures, pneumothorax or, or collapsed lungs, pleural effusions, which is fluid in the pleural cavity, pneumonia, emphysema, et cetera. So that can be useful. Uh, here's an example. Uh, there's three areas where it thinks there might be a fracture, let's zero in on those. And you can see that, yeah, I could see the fractures there. And so it picked up on that, that's very nice. Uh, there's other software that reads CT scans as opposed to just regular x-rays, identifies different kinds of lung nodules uh, as solid or calcified or partially calcified or ground glass, and provides information about position, size, density, uh, and so on. So lung nodule detection uh, in CT scans, another application. It detects four different conditions from a single uh, chest CT scan, nodules, fractures, bone metastases, bone tumors, and chronic lung diseases. So the idea here is that after you read it uh, with a human radiologist, then you have the CT scan uh, diagnosis carried out 
by AI and see if they match. Another thing that is useful for brain CT scans is to detect strokes, uh, which have characteristic patterns when they occur. Uh, and you'd like to know right away if there is a stroke present, and if so, how you might intervene. In fact, uh, it's even been used to di help diagnose COVID-19. And in these um, Chinese hospitals, 34 different Chinese hospitals reviewed 32,000 lung scans for this particular application to diagnose COVID-19 using CT lung scans. Another application, uh, it looks at the chest X-ray and identifies what pacemaker you've got simply by looking at the properties of the pacemaker on chest X-ray. I should remind you though, uh, that another way of doing this, which is more conventional, is to send a signal to the pacemaker and it sends back, uh, following interrogation, all its properties, its model number, its serial number and all that. So our, all modern day pacemakers come with an interrogation platform that you can use to get information on it, including how old the battery is and all that kind of stuff. Here, uh, the pacemaker software can identify over 1,600 different types of cardiac devices based on the chest X-ray. What about in, in anesthesia? It can be useful uh, in the future for preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care. And it's actually in use in some ways right now. In fact, the early application of um, artificial intelligence to anesthesia goes back 40 years to 1983. Here, Perry Miller from Yale University came up with a system called uh, critiquing, which would take a look at your anesthetic plan and comment on it in a reasonable way. So here is the article, and it, uh, uh, it shows the various kinds of augmented decision-making networks that can be used. For example, on the bottom, if you're going to use uh, inhalation anesthesia, uh, is it going to be enfluorate or halothane? Well, both those products, Enfluorine and Halothane, are not in clinical use in America, uh, although they might be used uh, elsewhere. Uh, but it shows you how outdated it is, 40 years old. But a lot of the concepts uh, are, are still appropriate and topical. And one of the things that uh, was there is he represented an anesthesia in this augmented decision network. It's kind of like a semantic network about the various stages of uh, anesthesia and how it might be carried out. So that was one of the first things uh, from 1983. Since that time, we've developed a lot of different uh, approaches to uh, anesthesia. One of the ones is closed loop anesthesia, where we have an infusion pump that looks at the, uh, delivers a drug like propofol and electroencephalogram to monitor brain activity. Uh, and then when the brain activity shows that you are light in anesthesia, it will give more drug. And when the anesthesia seems deeper than it should be, it gives left drug closed loop systems. So they're working on that, but there's regulatory and safety issues. Uh, and although some people think that this means that uh, anesthesiologists will be out of a job, everyone who knows anything about anesthesia knows that that's an unlikely scenario, at least for the next many, many years. Uh, here's an application of machine learning prediction of post-operative emergency. Uh, and they looked at 34,000 odd admissions from 2013 to 2016 to come up with an indicator whether or not you're likely to be readmitted via the emergency room. And so the metric was, how good are you at predicting that you'll come back to the emergency department in 30 days? And the uh, prediction of readmission was moderate in success. The metric sometimes used is the area under the curve which uh, if you're into this field, you'll understand is moderately good, but not as good as we would like. In the intensive care unit, we have a lot of instrumentation as uh, illustrated here, a lot of monitors, and you can see the many infusion pumps for various drugs. Uh, in 1988, here's the same Perry Miller. He talked about artificial intelligence research in anesthesia and intensive care. Since that time, there's a lot that has gone on. Here's some contemporary papers from the year 2000 and 2022, showing that there's a variety of new developments in these uh, uh, survey papers that are commonly used. Uh, clinically useful AI predictive models now are uh, exemplified by prediction of sepsis and mechanical ventilation. Uh, 
So the idea is that in the ICU, sepsis is a common problem. And here, this particular article uh, came up with an algorithm for independent clinical notes, achieved a high predictive accuracy of 12 hours before the onset of sepsis, area under the curve 0.94, much better than the area under the curve from a previous model. So this is from Nature Communications in 2021. This is getting better and better at predicting that there's going to be a problem. Again, uh, antibiotics, AI offers great potential identifying patients who may benefit from the administration of AI chosen antibiotics. Again, this is our paper from Healthcare uh, Communications. Uh, here is an article reviewing artificial intelligence in ventilation. The idea is what's the best way to ventilate a patient? What pressure waveform are you going to introduce into the breathing tube to achieve a particular goal? And so the author started with over 1,300 studies of mechanical ventilation. 95 were ultimately selected for their high quality designs. And they made recommendation that emphasized the validation of algorithms used in medical AI. So the simple idea is what pressure waveform are you going to introduce to the patient, to the breathing tube, and what gas mixture are you going to use for a particular condition? So again, medical diagnosis is one important Avenue where AI is turning out to be useful, diagnostic radiology we saw, but also in dermatology, pathology, and ophthalmology, which we don't have to go in, time to go into, and as well as predicting uh, the onset of sepsis, for example, or readmission to hospital prognosis, another AI application. So let's go on to a philosophical question. This is from the journal Science. What is consciousness, and could machines have it? So here's an abstract for those that are interesting, uh, and they go on and on for anybody who wants more detail. But there is a challenge, a philosophical challenge, and it's called the other minds problem. Mental states are privileged and cannot be directly shared. Consequently, one cannot be philosophically certain that other beings, including the people around you, are actually sentient as opposed to just behaving that way. Now, if they just behave that way, uh, that's what a robot might do, or an, uh, uh, an artificial human might do, but they might not actually be conscious, just present it as if they, if, as if they are. Uh, so that's the other mind's problem, and there's no solution to it that I'm aware. Uh, what about future AI platform ideas? We might suggest lower cost, older medications that may be just as effective as some of the more expensive patented uh, medications, uh, low-cost non-steroidals for pain management, offer multimodal pain management strategies that employ opioids conservatively and adhere to published pain management algorithms, offer insulin uh, administration strategies that adhere to recommended diabetes management guidelines, or offer diagnosis uh, guidance from separating routine from benign headaches, routine benign headaches from headaches requiring immediate uh, attention. For example, if the patient says, this is the worst headache in my life, I can't imagine that anyone would ever have a headache this bad, that could be a sign of a subarachnoid bleed uh, and requires a immediate intervention. Okay, um, so can ChatGPT work as a medical advisor? So I did a test case. Uh, I said to ChatGPT, my patient has a on new onset of chest pain, which he describes as sharp and worse during inspiration. Uh, so that's typically not cardiac pain. It sounds more like a pleuritic pain. Any ideas about diagnosis and some helpful tests? And it says, well, uh, pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, um, pleurisy. It got all of those. And I was thinking of pleurisy here. Uh, so yeah, not bad. Uh, Help diagnose it. It recommended some blood tests, chest X-ray, electrocardiogram, computed tomography, angiogram. Uh, you wouldn't want to do that right away, but it could be useful. And a D-dimer blood test to detect the presence of a substance of blood that may indicate a pulmonary embolism. Uh, so not bad. What's about chat? One of the things about Chat GPT, you can say, yeah, thanks for the blood test. Uh, what blood test would you recommend? And then it would come up with some other things if you want more elaborate details. Uh, here I asked, what are the considerations of providing general anesthesia for a parturient undergoing an emergency cesarean section of repeatal bradycardia that we mentioned earlier? And it came up with a whole pile of useful things. But as I said before, it didn't mention uh, 
it did this time it did mention the rapid sequence induction, which was not mentioned in the previous example. So that raises some interesting points. And that is, if you ask GPT a second time what's going on, it may give you a different answer. OK, uh, now here is an example of uh, an anatomical illustration showing how the trachea is normally sits anterior to over the esophagus. Because remember, when you're putting the patient to sleep and they've got a full stomach, you'd like to compress the esophagus so the stuff doesn't go up uh, the esophagus and into the airway. So here you've got the trachea sitting on top of the esophagus. It can compress the esophagus. And here you've got the spinal column. Here is the first thoracic vertebrae. Uh, so this is the front and this is the back. So let's see what it says here. It says, in general, the esophagus lies posterior to the trachea and separated from it by the vertebral column. <laughs> well, here it is. In general, the esophagus lies posterior to the trachea and is separated from it by... Okay, what can I say about that? But, hey, it's wrong. It is wrong. So I was surprised by that. Uh, so it doesn't have the kind of anatomical knowledge I would have expected. So chat GPT is like a genius friend who's super glad to help you. Happy to answer any question you might have it on almost any topic you might think of, from summarizing Plato's allegory of the cave to helping you in writing a computer program for your Arduino. Chat GPT is there to assist. And at no cost, if you want. I've never signed up for the cost version. It's astonishingly smart. It's wonderfully polite. There's nothing it can't comment on intelligently, eloquently, and with grace. But there's a problem. Your genius friend is not fully trustworthy. Sometimes he remembers things wrong. Sometimes he provides incorrect information, kind of like an honor student getting an oral exam who just misses getting an A plus in his assigned exam grade because while he did a pretty good job in answering, there's some misunderstandings that became apparent during the discussion. And here is a comment from a newspaper. Uh, only problem is it tends to hallucinate its own facts. So this is called the hallucination problem. What do we do? And here they say, well, run it for president. Trump sold, <laughs> sold over 30,000 lies while in office. Okay. Uh, well, they're practical matters because here um, two lawyers use ChatGPT uh, to analyze their case and inclu included citations of non-existent court cases. Uh, so ChatGPT will come up with court cases that don't actually exist. As well, they come up with scientific citations to the literature that don't exist. When I go to PubMed to find it, it's actually not there. So these got each paying a $5,000 fine. So the idea is if you're using ChatGPT, check out what it says, particularly for citations and particularly for anatomy. So this is, raises an issue. Here is an article. Should we trust computerized electrocardiogram interpretation? Here is a computer program that interprets this as atrial fibrillation. And I think any doctor who looks at this say, whoa, wait a moment, that's not atrial fibrillation. What's going on here? Uh, so the computer's interpretation was really wrong uh, and it's not clear what was going on. This was a vasovagal reaction in all likelihood. Further reading on the electrocardiogram problem, American Journal of Anesthesiology from 20 some years ago, misinterpretation of computerized ECG machine, case report and literature review. So if you're reading an electrocardiogram, read it first, see what the computer says. And if you disagree, well, go to a cardiologist. Let's close by talking about the responsible use of medical AI. Uh, things that our goals should be transparency and explainability that I mentioned earlier, data privacy and security that are obvious, regulatory compliance, and that's an issue that will come up as uh, um, Congress and, uh, and other regulatory bodies will go and figure out how to make AI more trustworthy. Accuracy, bias, and fairness in particular, clinical validation, human oversight, and so on. So there's challenges and limitations. A lack of standardization exists in data collection and analysis. Need for large amounts of data to train and validate AI algorithms and ethical considerations such as data privacy and security. There are indeed dangers to humanity, some people at least think. Facial recognition can allow uh, an authoritarian states to keep track on everybody, speaker identification to keep track on everybody. Robots in warfare, 
there's an argument there that warfare robots uh, 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 could be dangerous. The counter argument is that they're not likely to shoot someone who's wa uh, waving a white flag of surrender because uh, th that could be built into their AI protocols. It could be uh, trained so that it doesn't shoot anybody who's lying on the ground in a prone position uh, because they are not dangerous. Uh, another thing that's a big issue in China is the social credit uh, uh, process where every citizen is given a social credit uh, number and are treated accordingly. Uh, now, here is the philosopher Nick Bostrom. Uh, he uh, speaks uh, extensively on the problem of artificial and general intelligence and uh, fears of artificial and general intelligence potentially damaging or destroying humanity or uh, need to be addressed, investigated by AI community. And in fact, they're doing exactly that in academic groups and in AI discussion forums. Differences in culture and political systems around their world dictate that various sectors will vary in their provision of resources and the implementation of these rules and policies. But here's the book. Uh, it's called Super Intelligence. Uh, uh, Bill Gates says, I highly recommend this book. Uh, I read this book and I would describe it with two words. It is exhaustive and it is exhausting. Uh, it's a not an easy book to read because he, he wants to cover every imaginable possibility. And that's what he does. He makes it exhaustive. Another concern is that AI might be tricked into making it easy to commit horrible crimes, like providing detailed knowledge on how to make a potent lethal neurotoxin that could be easily added to the water's reservoir, or providing guidance on dirty bomb construction. While AI can bring about numerous benefits and advances, it also provides uh, pose a certain risk if misused or falls in the wrong hand. In fact, not too long ago, I met a guy who is an expert on biological weapons, and he is a consultant to open AI to try and come up with techniques that would prevent the dissemination of knowledge to unauthorized personnel about neurotoxins and how you might make them at home. Another interesting issue is the emergent properties. Could AI come um, up with an intelligence that simply beats us because they are just so much more intelligent. Uh, so the idea is that it might develop emergent properties that mere human beings can not be able to understand or control, not having sufficient neurocognitive means or brain power, at least without some means of human brain enhancement. And another talk, I'll talk about the possibilities of brain enhancement. Uh, you'll get that at the uh, annual general meeting. Here, we'll just talk about some of the examples. Flocking behavior of birds is an emergent property arising from the individual interactions between individual birds. Each bird follows simple rules, maintaining a certain distance, aligning the direction of movement, and yet they get a flock that uh, operates with cohesive and coordinating flocking patterns. So emergent properties that are novel or unexpected uh, may arise at a higher level of complexity and emergent properties may differ explicitly from explicitly programmed behavior. So consciousness is, a post is postulated to be an emergent property of certain complex systems, the best known example being the human brain. But could consciousness or sentience arise from an AI? And as I said, the other mind's problem suggests that there's no way of knowing for sure because mental states are privileged uh, and are not accessible directly to other people. But here is a comment. Uh, some experts, uh, this one from Scientific American, uh, it is certainly much more than a stochastic parrot, and it builds certainly builds some representations of the world, although I do not think that is quite how humans build an internal world model, says one AI researcher. So this emergent properties are interesting, but will it become sentient? A good example of a, a an emergent system is a bicycle functional property of being a transportation device once it's been assembled from its components. And in fact, in natural and uh, artificial systems, uh, emergent properties can occur. Here's two books, one dealing with the physics, one dealing with biology for those interested in more detail. So ChatGPT appears to one example of an emergent system. An intellect that emerges from ChatGPT is a real, but I would argue non-sentient being who might be thought of as a handy but not fully reliable assistant in all matters 
of knowledge and wisdom. Clearly, ChatGPT is in need of evolution and improvement, eliminating such shortcomings as AI hallucinations, citing incorrect legal cases and scientific reports. But that's just a matter of the next generation product. Improvements to ChatGPT and other chatbots, they will include real-time links to resources like PubMed.gov and Wikipedia, uh, as well as the legal literature to ensure that the information provided is of the highest quality. And I asked ChatGPT, well, what are the risks to humanity posed by unregulated AI? And it mentioned accidents, malfunctions, bias and discrimination, uh, job displacement, that's a big one, some would argue, cybersecurity threats and existential risks. So uh, again, these are a lot of the standard stuff that you have seen in the AI literature uh, and in the book, Superintelligence. Is using ChatGPT a form of plagiarism? I asked ChatGPT that because that's something that is an issue that comes up in mm -hmm. scientific, uh, scientific reports. Using ChatGPT to generate content be considered as a form of plagiarism if the generated content is presented as one's original work without prior attribution. More commonly, people would use ChatGPT to get ideas and to make sure that certain things that uh, were identified with ChatGPT that they hadn't thought of are included in their discussion. Uh, so here is a discussion that ChatGPT offered. I have talked to some um, medical editors, some journal editors. One said that if ChatGPT was used at all, they wouldn't accept the manuscript, which I think is very unfair because you can use ChatGPT for idea generation. We'll see how that plays out in the end. But uh, if you're using ChatGPT in, GPT in a talk, it's customary now to identify that as a source, perhaps as a source of, of pride. So in conclusion, while AI has the potential to transform medicine and improve patient outcomes, it remains important to carefully address the challenges and limitations used. As it continues to evolve, it's increasingly likely there'll be an important tool in healthcare delivery and important to deliver improved care to patients. But I would like to add a postscript, a cautionary, story, scientists are now developing mini human brains in a Petri dish, which might be yet another form of computing machinery or artificial intelligence, or who knows what it is. The goal of being able to produce, to study neurological diseases, researchers create lab-grown brains using stem cells. So you're growing brain in a Petri dish. These are called organoids, organoids, Wikipedia says that it's a miniaturized and simplified version of an organ produced in vitro with three dimensions that mimics the key functional structure and biological complexity, uh, complexity of that organ. They're derived from one or two cells in a culture, and then they self-organize in a three-dimensional culture because of their self-renewal and differentiation cap, uh, capabilities. So here's an article I, you might want to read if you're interested in this, Organized Intelligence, The New Frontier in Biocomputing and Intelligence in a Dish. Will these be hooked up to digital computers for various applications? In all likelihood, yes. In fact, they're already hooked up to digital computers in order to transduce the various neuronal signals. And they recommend a variety of things. Here is the key points that they recommend. Uh, and I include them in uh, this for anyone who wants to get a copy of the slide set or go to the article, which is an open access article. You can read it in detail. Uh, they offer a detailed analysis of what they think is the future in terms of various kinds of trajectories and with emphasis, again, uh, on the ethical issues and what ethicists in integrated into the research teams. And uh, no doubt, uh, this will be an interesting domain of the future. So is it ethical to grow a brain in a Petri dish? This is a new uh, domain that... Uh, I'm introducing it to you now. It's basically uh, less than 10 years old, and we're going to see more and more technology based on that. So that brings us to an end. I hope you enjoyed the discussion, and uh, I'm going to hang around for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. That is really interesting. Um, I'm going to start off. We did have a question while you were uh, during your talk. Are you going to discuss BCI technology and how it works? Uh, what technology? BCI, B as in boy, C as in Charlie, 
BCI as an industry? Uh, well, if I knew what BCI was, I would comment. <laughs> oh, and she is no longer on the, the person that asked this. So I'll have to ask her next time I see her. So yeah, it's a, uh, BCI is a TLA that I'm not familiar with. Yeah. TLA, three letter acronym. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there, there are several things. I mean, I'm sure everybody has questions, so I don't want to hog your time. But since the time the open letter got out, what is the impact on uh, the develop, AI development for the medical? What is there? Did, 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 you, did you get all that? I, I did not. Let's try it one more time. Okay. Since the since the uh, time that the open, I don't know if he's going to be able to hear you that far away. You might have to come yeah. closer to the computer because the microphone's over here. Oh, okay. So since the time the open letter came out, uh, I'm assuming it has, uh, it would have some implications. I'm not sure exactly how it will affect uh, AI uh, as it relates to the medical or healthcare services. I'm, uh, right now, I don't think any government has taken any action on it, but it seems to be picking up more and more steam because nearly all scientists have signed up, signed so far. So what's the open letter? Uh, the open letter came out to by the 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 grandfather of the AI. That's, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, the idea is to put a moratorium on AI work for at least six months and sit down and figure it out, uh, what are the implications? And I think the biggest risk they pointed out is the existential risk. Yes, uh, so what will happen is that the scientists will get together with the ethicists and the politicians and policymakers and come up with a guidance document. And that will be the basis for policy in North America and possibly in Europe. Other countries may say, well, that doesn't apply to us and we're going to do whatever we want. If you go back 30 years, there was a similar thing going on in genetics where there was a moratorium on gene editing until uh, the issues are sorted out and the scientists and the other people, philosophers and policymakers got together and came up with some suggestions that were followed uh, in Europe and North America, uh, but not necessarily everywhere. As you know, for example, in China, there have been genetic experiments, not necessarily legal in China, uh, for embryo modification. Uh, so. The likelihood is that there will be scientific conferences held and symposia held, and people will more or less follow those rules. For one reason, if they don't follow the rules, the journals will not allow them to be published. Did that answer your question? It does. Um, I, I guess Mark. I don't know if you can hear me again. You should probably just sit so over I, here. <laughs> I think the, the, the biggest argument that uh, these scientists had is essentially they looked at the uh, the speed of progression, like ChatGPT 3.5 came out, and within a year and a half, they came up with the ChatGPT 4, which was almost 10 times more intelligent than that. And they estimated its IQ to be like 155. The idea is within a year and a half, the AI would become so in, so much more intelligent and so far beyond human control that we would we would be completely uh, like helpless in terms of uh, doing anything to control it. So that's why they wanted immediate moratorium for six months before we do any work. But at the same time, as you said, I mean, most people are not going to follow it. Even Google kind of said uh, they know that where they're going is dangerous, but since nobody else is just stopping, they can't afford to stop. And that uh, is a good point. Yeah, I think what you'd have to do is 
take a look at the various policy recommendations that are emerging when you take a look at that field. It may be that our understanding is not sufficiently strong that we can actually come up with good recommendations. Uh, let me give you an example from history. Uh, when the Great Plague went all over Europe in the 1300s, and then again in the 1600s, uh, a third of Europe died, the leader of the world at the time was the Pope. And the Pope got all the scientists and great minds together to come up with an answer to what the problem is and, and what to do about it. And the scientists of the time said, well, the problem, your highness, your, your holiness, is that the stars are in the incorrect alignment. So uh, it's, it's hard to know how is this is going to do because we can't predict emergent properties, uh, but there are a variety of countermeasures and precautionary measures that can be taken. And these are discussed in the book, Superintelligence by Bostrom. So if, if you're interested in that point, I would start with his book. Thanks. Well, I had a question or more of a comment. I, I, I don't know if it's which one it is because I haven't thought it through yet. Um, so I, I think that a lot of this AI they're coming out with, especially in the medical field, is very beneficial, um, you know, like with the medication dispensers and it leads to less uh, chance of patients getting wrong meds. And then, you know, a lot of the things you talked about tonight. But my concern is... Um, that it's going to lead to people or the physicians forgetting the textbook because they're going to be, rely so heavily on what the computer's telling them that, okay, you have this and this and this, so this is what the patient has. Um, instead of them using their whole knowledge base to make the best decision because it's too easy if the computer tells you to do it. And it kind of reminds me of, um, you know, when you go to the fast food drive through how the kids don't even know how to use a cash register anymore, because all they have to do is punch pictures and it comes up and they don't even have to add numbers and can't even give you change. So, you know, I'm afraid that down the road, if we get into too much AI technology and medicine, that doctors are going to kind of forget the actual medicine part of it. The good news is we have board exams. Uh, and so if you forget your medicine, you're not going to pass the board exams. A bigger concern then might be you get lazy and you rely on the, on the computer without thinking. Uh, but your thinking is, shows up in the documentation you provide, in the, in the notes that you write. Uh, and the likelihood is that you might use ChatGPT or a medical version of ChatGPT that is more meaningful uh, to provide approaches to dealing with something. For example, you have a patient who's anemic. Well, what's the standard approach to uh, managing the guy with a, a woman with a hemoglobin of seven? Uh, and th that's a year two medical question that most people would have no problem answering at all. Uh, so I think the basics will always be there for the complex stuff. We often consult with specialists and we often consult with medical textbooks, but not necessarily the medical textbooks that I had when I began. Uh, there is a program or a resource uh, called uptodate.com, which is rather expensive, but it's up to date much better than any textbook. Uh, and it is the go-to source that I would use over most of the textbooks, because it's just so much fresh and it's and it's so well carefully edited. Uh, but their standard text will be around for a long time, uh, particularly for the preparation of board exams. Yeah, and I I can see that, and I know you don't. You just have to take your board exams once, though. Oh, but not, I'm not anymore. That's changed. Oh, is it? Well, I'm just looking at several generations down the road how lazy they might get with too much AI. 
So. Uh, yes. Uh, so the, the, there likely would be examples where some people got lazy. Uh, but remember, if things go wrong, you're still responsible for the patient and you can get sued. And uh, you oh, that's true. could easily be sued or uh, be chastised for your laziness, like those lawyers who got who got a five thousand uh, dollar fine for not bothering to check their citations. I think I'm pretty scared of doctors getting lazy with or without AI, though. I mean. Not like it's normal, but there definitely you sometimes run into a doctor who seems to do everything on autopilot. Yeah. Well, they may be doing things on autopilot because they've done it so often that it's, uh, there's almost no thinking involved. Yeah, but that just makes me nervous that they'll miss something. I mean, human or AI, mistakes do happen. And, Absolutely. And so yep. You always need to be working to make sure you have checks and balances. And AI can be useful to prevent errors as well. For example, oh, I gave the vancomycin right. example where the machine says, oh, you took uh, vancomycin out of the cart. Okay, well, remember to give it slowly. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's going to be very beneficial and, and prevent a lot of errors. But I just you know, technology came out and people are on social media and they don't socialize anymore. You know, they talk to their friends on Facebook or social media or or text. And did they say about books when they came out first time? Yeah, they they start socializing. People are not going to talk because they keep reading it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess it's just a change in times. Of course, we don't, um, we don't know how to make change anymore. I have not. And some repeat the questions. Oh. Um, well, the one question actually, it was more of a comment that, that she was concerned that, um, both it, human and AI error, that that's even happening now where she feels that uh, some of the doctors are just going on autopilot, um, and don't maybe she doesn't feel that they think through all the potential options. Whereas Dr. Dora responded that, you know, some of them are so experienced that they can do on autopilot because it's so instinctual for them now. So, but I mean, in medical profession, just like any other profession, you have protocols where you have to go through the steps. So the chances of missing out something would be if you break the protocol. Because yeah. If the AI would help you to go through the protocol and not miss anything. Yeah. So it was just commented that that in medicine that there are certain protocols and the AI could help you go through the protocols and make sure that you don't miss anything. Checklists, AI-based checklists, or even paper-based yeah, exactly. checklists. Yeah, so, and so for those of you on Zoom, we're, we're actually at a restaurant and there's like, I don't know, 15, 20 of us here. That's why it's, um, we don't have a centralized microphone and it, it might sound like mumbling to you, but... Um, I ask them to please get up and approach the speed, approach the microphone, but they don't do it. No. But anyway, anybody else in here have any questions? Dr. Doyle? Anybody online on Zoom have any more questions for Dr. Doyle? And oh, I want to make a comment that um, for those of you attending the annual gathering here in Baltimore in two weeks. Dr. Doyle will be presenting, I believe it's on Saturday, um, on the science behind consciousness, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. So if you are at the annual gathering, the AG, make sure you stop by and uh, uh, catch his talk. So, well, as always, Dr. Doyle, we appreciate you, you presenting to us. We find your talk so fascinating and thought provoking and um, so I'm so glad that you were able to, to uh, give this talk for us again tonight. Okay. So. Please let me know if you have another need for other talks. Oh, uh, I always have needs. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I could just schedule you every month if you'd like. <laughs> no, but definitely I'll be in touch. Um, I, I have to see, I'm not, I'm not supposed to set up the speaker for next month. So, and actually they just told me that the, 
restaurant is going to be closed the when we normally would have it. So I have to see uh, our work around or if we're going to just even uh, cancel for July. But but definitely, I'll be in touch. I'm sure that we'll have a, we'll def want to hear another talk from you. Yeah, and the talk I'm working on now is what are the medical humanities, which is a hybrid between the humanities you studied in university and medicine. An example being the problem of suffering. So, are you going to ask your chat, chat GPT? <laughs> well, I think you already did actually on 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 the, about the poem on suffering. So, right, yeah, yeah, it's it's filled with interesting insights. No, definitely. Yeah. Yep. One more question on the ethics part. I know uh, doctors have their own code of ethics that they have to follow, and uh, programmers have their own code of ethics probably they follow, I'm, although I'm not very sure, just like all other professions have it. But what happens to the, the gap between the research of the AI and the implementation of the AI? Are there specific code of ethics there for manufacturer or entrepreneurs to keep from jumping into something without checking out all the possible consequences? Or is there a board that even, is there a board out there that even is considering that? Um, the answer is sort of. Uh, the, the oldest computer society, the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM, yeah. has been interested in ethical issues for a long time. And that would be the first place I would go to, to see what kind of recommendations they have had uh, for the ethical use of computers and ethical use of programs uh, and the ethical approach to debugging software and that kind of stuff. So that's the Association for Computing Machinery. That's where I would start my search. Thanks. <clears throat> but that's usually towards the development part. I was more thinking about the gap between the development and the uh, general use into the manufacturing or entrepreneurial work. Uh, it's, it's just like somebody somebody comes up with like a, a, the software for adjusting the genes that was available, but they, they were code of ethics that the whole world followed that they're not going to be using it for manipulating the genes. And, and some people in China actually ended up breaking it. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, that's a very good example. <laughs> Anybody else? Friends, we'll let everybody sign off for the night. And everybody have a good weekend. Thanks very much. Thank you. And I'll be I'll definitely be in touch. Thank you. Okay. Until later. Bye-bye.